Okay, our fourth and uh, final speaker in our morning session, we'll be continuing this afternoon, is Abner Shimoni. Uh, we've heard a lot about already. He is a professor of philosophy and professor of physics emeritus here at Boston University. He received his PhD from Yale in 1953 and a PhD in physics uh, from Princeton in 1962 under the supervision of Eugene Wigner. Uh, in physics circles, he is best known for his seminal work on quantum non-locality uh, and developing an empirically testable form of Bell's theorem. His two-volume collection of papers titled The Search for a Naturalistic Worldview uh, won the 1996 Lakatosh Award for the best work published in the philosophy of science. He has also served as the president of the Philosophy of Science Association, and he'll be speaking to us today on his reminiscences um, of the Center for Philosophy and History of Science here at BU. Please welcome Abner Shimoni. It was an honor to be invited to speak at a 50th birthday celebration. By the way, it's the, the article is A, because there were several 50th birthday celebrations <laughs> of the Boston University Center for Philosophy and History of Science. I accepted proposing the topic reminiscences. That was rash, because my memory of remote events has long faded, all the more because of massive anesthesia for surgery in 2010. Fortunately, I was able to consult volume 100 of Boston Studies in the Philosophy of Science entitled Naturalistic Epistemology, a Symposium of Two Decades, edited by Deborah Nails, who is present, and myself, which contains versions of some lectures to the center. With this book, I am able to reminisce ideas of Judson Webb, John Hefner, Donald Campbell, Joseph Agassi, and myself. Incidentally, the number 100, the volume number of this in the series, is impressive in its revelatory of the energy dedicated by Bob Cohen to the center. I shall organize my reminiscences about the enterprise of naturalistic epistemology, its basis theses, objections that have been brought against it, and attempts to refine its theses by serious attention to criticism. Theses, is that, is that showing? Yes. Oh, good. Just two, two simple theses. This, these are just basic things. A, human beings, including their cognitive faculties, are entities in nature. B, the laws governing nature have, with remarkable success, been explored by the natural sciences. That's all. There'll be lots of details later. Objections. Is that on? Oh, good. First, nature is best, this concept, objection, or a Kantian objection. Nature is best understood by Kant uh, as the sum of appearances insofar as they stand by virtue of an inner principle of causality and thoroughgoing interconnection. But since causality is a, ca that's the end of the quotation, but since causality is a category imposed by the understanding, that mental faculty uh, is, is the source of lawfulness in nature. Therefore, thesis A, that, um, um, cognitive faculties are entities in nature is an inversion. Second objection, the findings of the natural sciences are descriptive, but the enterprise of epistemology is essentially normative, what we ought to believe. Hence, thesis B is a gross conflation of is and ought. Third objection, the remarkable success attributed to natural science in, ex in exhibiting the laws of nature is a, is a commitment to the reliability of induction, which is a part of epistemology. Hence, thesis B is a case of circular reasoning, and uh, that is the, now the natural science is an application of methodology, and methodology depends on results in the natural sciences, hence circularity. Now, the first of the topics in um, um, the book Naturalistic Epistemology is Judson Webb's lecture called Immanuel Kant and the Greater Glory of Geometry. 
It's a penetrating critique of Kant, whose transcendental epistemology dismisses both of the um, both of the theses of naturalistic epistemology. Instead, Kant's transcendental epistemology postulates cognitive faculties which impose various things. One kind of, of uh, faculty imposes formal conditions of space and time upon the sensibility. Another kind of cognitive faculty is a faculty of understanding, which I mentioned before, which is the source of lawfulness and experience, according to Kant. Now, let's go back to the first one. The a priori validity of the principles of geometry, according to Kant, follows from the imposition of the formal conditions of space. And here's another quotation from him. To know anything in space, for instance, a line, I must draw it mentally and thus synthetically bring into being a determinate combination of the given manifold, so that this act is at the same time the unity of consciousness. Now Kant's favorite example of this a priori intuition is that between two points only one straight line is possible. Webb does not question the plausibility of this particular instance of conceptual construction but he's shrewdly critical of other constructions proposed by Kant, as for instance, this is another quotation from Kant, in the proposition the, that three points always lie in a plane. Webb comments, but how can we draw a plane in thought? Even to draw one literally on paper requires all the conventions of perspective. In fact, Kant had continued the passage by insisting, here's another quotation, we cannot represent the three dimensions of space save by setting three lines at right angles to one another from the same point. But, but here is Webb's question to Kant at this point. How can we set them in thought without prior knowledge of perspective, which is presumably a physical thing, not, not mentally imposed. In addition to these difficulties, facing Kant's attempts to account for the a priori construction of a basic geometrical concept such as the plane, there is a general problem posed by J.F. Herbart, who was Kant's successor at Königsberg, by the way. And he raises the question, whence the definite shape of definite things? and Webb sharpened that objection. They argued that to ascribe the shape of a thing in itself is inconsistent with the a priority of ge geometrical concepts and propositions. So that won't do. You can't say that the shape is due to the thing in itself, even though Kant believes in things in themselves. But on the other hand, to ascribe the definiteness of shape of a particular object to the faculty which imposes the formal properties of space is a violation of its ideal character. So no definite shape of a definite thing from either source, either from the things in themselves or for the mental faculty which imposes characteristics of space. Kant appears even in his opus postimum to be struggling with his dilemma. And Webb finally reacts by an Continue. Oh, oh, thank you. Webb's final reaction is not to become a Kantian, but instead he cites an evolutionary treatment of human experiment of human experience, which is a component of naturalistic epistemology, and we'll get to that later. The second essay that I'm going to talk about, or reminisce, or at least I reminisce after reading the book again, um, is Donald Campbell's essay, Neurological Embodiment of Beliefs and Gaps in the Fit of Phenomena to Noumena. Of course, he rejects Kantian transcendental epistemology. Instead, he formulates a version of naturalistic epistemology that he refers to in two different ways. 
One as descriptive epistemology, because it seeks to record which decision rules science has used implicitly or explicitly in presumably valid decisions in the past, and thus can be seen as a hypothetical contingent search for normative rules. <coughs> but Campbell has another name for his version of, of uh, epistemology. He refers to it as evolutionary, relying on the biological theory of natural selection for trusting human cognitive apparatus. And once the human apparatus is trusted, that justifies the presumption of validity of decision rules in historically mature science. And here's a quotation from Campbell. The central insight is that biological natural selection and other selection processes allow the real world, the real world to edit and select among variations providing the fit between belief or knowledge and the real world. Now, that's not quite all I'll say about Campbell, but I want to do some things in between. But what I'm going to come to later on is a surprising quotation from Campbell modifying his commitment to descriptive epistemology by allowing a place for both the correspondence and the coherent theories of truth. The third essay that I will comment on or reminisce about is John Hefner's essay, Causal Relations in Visual Perception. Hefner, by the way, got his doctorate in the philosophy department at Boston University. Um, it is a specialized essay in that it considers theoretical questions and empirical data only consider concerning vision with little mention of other sensory modes. On the other hand, it's broad in its attention to a variety of physical and mental factors in visual phenomena. An illuminating example of breath in Hefner's treatment is the explicit discussion of, now I quote, at least three different levels in which causal relations can be discovered in vision. The first level studies sensory processes as functions of physical factors impinging directly on the sense organs without attention to a cognitive factor, uh, beams of light uh, impinging on the eye and, and uh, triggering reactions in the, in the retina. The second level supplements the first by, cons by considering also cognitive faculties, such as memory, co cognitive factors such as memory, expectation, and residues of culture. The third level of causal explanation considers its history within a single organism and also from an evolutionary point of view within the biological ancestry of the organism. Hefner notes that at this level, the third level, a metaphysical intrusion of the mind-body of the mind-body problem may occur, but he has characterized this to be unnecessary. Uh, I don't believe that, but just, I just cite that as part of his treatment. And I'll come back to the place of metaphysics in a, in a little bit. Hefner strongly advocates co conducting causal epistemology on all, th all three levels, and he particularly regards a restriction to the first level, the level of just considering light operating on the retina, as uh, an uncritical commitment to an analogy between vision and the action of a camera. The human visual faculty is more complicated than a camera. Now, the interplay of these three levels in visual causality is responsible for the amazing variety of visual experience. And here are, here are two examples at opposite extremes of um, the variety of visual experience due to all three levels operating. It contributes to the practical reliability of vision. A plausible example of that contribution is visual in visual geometry is visual geometry, which is based on the integration of direct sensory processes with informative memories. For example, he says, 
Perceivers in Western culture tend strongly to see photographs and line drawings as perspectival representations of three-dimensional objects. Now, on the other hand, this variety of levels of causality in vision give rise to visual illusions. Here's, here's his favorite example. A, a drawing of a duck-rabbit figure can be taken to represent either animal according to suggestion, look, there's a duck there, look, there's a rabbit there, or by chance, what you happen to pick up when you first look at the figure. Hefner concludes that the multivalence of the causal factors of visual experience is a striking example of the contribution of empirical data to philosophy. As the father of a painter, I am also I am also impressed by the potential and actual, thank you, and actual contributions of this multivalence to an artist's technical repertoire. My son did not inherit my disability with mechanical things. All right, the next part of, of naturalistic epistemology that I'll talk about is a debate between myself and Joseph Agassi. This is the most vivid and I hope most reliable of my reminiscences. It begins with my lecture called Integral Epistemology, which is even broader than naturalistic epistemology. It includes logical factors, for example, followed by Agassi's critique, which is called The Case of Abner Shimoni, and followed in turn by my comment on his critique. The first of these three papers is the result of my attempt to mesh various suggestions favoring naturalistic epistemology. The second is, a prese is presented, that is the second being Agassi's paper, is a refutation of my proposals. The third is my reply, partly accepting Agassi's criticism and partly attempting to answer them. Now I have to point out that the word integral is an ambiguous word. In, it's intended in my title, Integral Epistemology, in two ways. The first way is meant to combine several different conceptions of epistemology. For example, to mesh a descriptive epistemology, as envisaged by Campbell, with an analytic epistemology, of which there are various versions, ranging from Descartes' cogito to applications of logic and semantics to induction explored by the Veni Vienna Circle, notably by Carnap. The second sense of integral, which I intend, is the meshing of methodology with results of scientific investigations. At this point, I say I should have put in in my paper not just scientific investigations, but metaphysical investigations. The great historical example of the meshing of methodology with metaphysics is Aristotle. He has the posterior analytics, which is a great methodological treatise, and he has the metaphysics. And they, the two of them are inseparable. And that's, that's an inspiration for me. Uh, I'll say one more thing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, this, the second sense of integral is the target of an objection mentioned at the beginning of this talk, namely that it is a lapse into circularity, in fact, into vicious circularity. So the objection goes, in that scientific results are accepted as the outcome of applying a methodology, and the methodology itself is su suggested by scientific results. I grant the accusation of circularity, but I shall defend this philosophical strategy as virtuous rather than vicious. Now I'm going to go back for a moment to Campbell. Another example of the second sense of integration is the combination of two well-known opposing concepts, truth, the correspondence concept and the coherence concept. 
This integration is recommended by Campbell, even though his descriptive epistemology seems at first to incorporate a correspondence theory of truth. After all, a correct description of the outside world, which he advocates, is tantamount to a semantical correspondence between the language of the description and the objective constitution of the things described. Now, even though it's an oddity given Campbell's general position, I still would defend him because I would say that his descriptive epistemology is sophisticated enough to recognize the occurrence of perceptual errors which may be detected and corrected by attention to context. This sophistication permits a strategy which is conciliatory. This is a quotation from Campbell. Accept the correspondence meaning of truth as the goal of science and acknowledge coherence as the major but still fallible symptom of truth. I, I of course, want to, in my integral epistemology, I would like to include the so enriched car, uh, descriptive part of Campbell's work. Now, I wish to dignify the circularity, calling the circularity of naturalistic epistemology virtuous by noting its affinity to the dialectic of Socrates and Plato, where initial premises are proposed by one of the interlocutors and refinements are eventually achieved by the interplay of intelligent questions and answers. The dialogue which I envisage is the path to a sec satisfactory naturalistic epistemology has not to my satisfaction been adequately composed, but I propose several procedural steps which should be useful for an eventual composition of a, of a, a worthy dialectic. So here are the, uh, I'm really supplementing those basic theses which I gave at the beginning of my talk. Number one, common sense judgments about ordinary matters of fact should not be discounted without clear positive reasons. Second, the road to inquiry should not be blocked. A famous maxim of Peirce, one of many, as John Stachel pointed out. Third, epistemology and natural science, to which I now add natural science and metaphysics, should mesh and complement each other, especially via inductive reasoning. The fourth is rather complicated. Uh, uh, that a vindicatory argument is a rational form of epistemological justification. Now, what I mean by a vindicatory argument is an argument that a certain method M will yield good approximations to the truth if any method will do so, so nothing indispensable will be lost and something may be gained by using method M. And I'm going to illustrate that by talking about scientific induction. I think a vindicatory argument can be used for, for induction in the sciences, even though one uses probabilities, and probabilities may be erroneous, or, or they are compatible with negative results or false results. So uh, let's see, is there a new? Uh, yeah, you could do the, the next one with the different types of probabilities. Okay. Typically, given a background of knowledge B, ra uh, a range of possible theories, T1 dot 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 Tn, is probed by observation or experiment with outcome E. Three sets of probabilities connecting B, T1 through Tn, and E are considered. By the way, N may be infinite. I don't say that, but it's that's what I have in mind, where probability of a proposition S given proposition A designated P of S on A, is that on the P S slash A? Or do you have P T I? Pardon me? Oh, it is there. P of S on A. That's right. It's understood 
in a sufficient careful way as the rational degree of belief in S upon assumption of the truth of A. Yes. The three sets are probabilities of the theories under consideration. All the TIs says P of TI on the background information B. The second set is the likelihood of E assuming TI and B. The third is the posterior probabilities of the various TIs assuming B and E. And that's P of TI on B and E. Um, what I didn't say here is that the, um, uh, a, complete, a complete and beautiful logic of these probabilities was discovered independently, I believe, by Frank Ramsey and Bruno de Finetti um, using the, um, the guiding principle that um, that um, if one has two probabilities, two, two propositions, two propositions, and one wants to assign probabilities to those two propositions, you must not assign probabilities which have this undesirable, undesirable uh, outcome for a better. That is, there always would be the possibility that someone would propose odds for a bet, for two bets, bets on the two propositions, which would be acceptable given the subject's assignment of probabilities to the two propositions, and in which the, the subject, the better, is sure to lose. So, for example, uh, if there are two propositions, T and not T, and you assign probability two-thirds to each of them, the better will say, all right, you put up a dollar on, for your bet on T, and if you win, you get, you get uh, two dollars. And if you lose, uh, you lose You put up, I'm sorry, if you, you put up a dollar and a half, if you win, you win two dollars. Then on the second proposition, not T, you put up a dollar and a half, if you win, you win two dollars, and if you lose, you forfeit your dollar and a half. Well, that would be plain stupid, because you are sure, you are sure to lose Two dollars, and the most you can win is a dollar and a half. So, so that would be a a stupid a stupid type of assignment of probabilities, a stupid set of assignment of odds in betting. Now it looks it looks just common sense and ordinary, but you can get pretty much the whole logic of probability out of this. Somebody may know the history, whether Giffinetti, who came later than Ramsey, knew Ramsey's work. I, I, I have not found that out. Somebody may know. Now, my four pro proposals concerning the concept of integral epistemology can be illustrated concerning these probabilities. Uh, pr proposal one, concerning the acceptability of common sense judgments of fact is implicit in taking the outcome E as an appropriate element in each of the two types of posterior probabilities. That is, the outcome of, of, a, uh, of an experiment is presumably some diagram uh, or some reactions on the recording apparatus of your experiment and common sense judges what those outcomes are. And those, sh those should not be questioned even though we grant the possibility of perceptual errors. Proposal two, against blocking the road to inquiry, 
is implicit in the open-mindedness of admitting a variety of theories, TI, as possible explanations of empirical outcomes, E. Though it must be recognized that the character of this openness is a subtle matter and needs to be specified in detail, an influential proposal to achieve open-mindedness manageably is the simplicity ordering of Jeffries and Rinch in a paper of 1919, according to which the admissible theories TI are all given, are all expressed in terms of numerical parameters, and the probabilities of these various TI, now these are the prior probabilities of these TI, diminish as the values of a parameter increases. Um, such orderings are aesthetic and they're amenable to calculation, but they're also somewhat artificial. The concept of openness, which I propose, I call the tempering principle, prescribing that no TI compatible with background B be assigned a probability so low that any plausible empirical evidence would give TI a posterior probability lower than that given to each of its rivals. So you're, you're not open-minded open to TI if you give it a lower probability than, than it's given a lower prior probability than is given to each of its rival hypotheses. Now, proposal three is clearly satisfied by the fact that on the one hand, the rules of probability are methodological tools, whereas on the other hand, background B and range of theories taken seriously inductive logic are supplied largely by the state of natural science, and I would add, and state of metaphysics prior to the investigation in question. As to the fourth proposal, that is that uh, a vindicatory argument is favorable to induction because the process of induction leading to preference of theory T from among the entire range of seriously proposed theories T1 to up to Tn, is a remarkable balance between conservatism and radicalism. The conservatism enters in that the prior probability of T is a tentative acquiescence of scientific achievements of the past, while the radicalism enters in that the likelihood of T depends upon an empirical outcome, an outcome E, which is controlled neither by the investigator's proclivities nor by those of the community, but rather is nature's choice. So the process of induction is a detailed process which follows these uh, sub supplementary proposals for, in in for uh, integral epistemology. Now, Joseph Agassi's critique of my proposals for integral epistemology is partly playful and teasing, and when I'm in the right mood, I am amused. Partly, however, it is serious, and even when it comments negatively, I find suggestions that could enrich an, an integral epistemology. Proposals for integ integral epistemology were intended to strike a balance between excessive reliance upon a rigid scheme for assessing competing theories and the anarchy of proceeding intuitively when neither hard data nor precise logic suffice to compute the posterior probabilities. Agassi judges that I fail to achieve this aim, and instead my proposals are, in his word, wishy-washy. He argues against their adequacy by pointing to exemplary chapters in the history of science in which great discoveries were made by researchers who followed their own instincts and passages and passions. He cites good citation, Faraday sought effects for decades. At times his search was crowned with success, at times not, yet he stuck with all his hopes. Now, I would say certainly the case histories of great scientific discoveries are relevant to assessments of methodology in at least two ways. First, they may be able to teach us how a discoverer conceived of a novel theoretical explanation T for the phenomenon of concern and thought of experimental tests for T. Second, 
they, the, they, uh, the case histories uh, tell you something about the discoverer's procedure for comparing the credibility of T with other possible explanations of the phenomenon. Now, I grant that the first lesson is very interesting for epistemology, but it does not concern induction. The process of inventing induction, inventing theories, is called abduction by Perth, whereas induction is concerned with comparing the probabilities of competing theories given the empirical evidence. The second lesson does concern induction because the open-mindedness of the tempering condition is psychologically different in case the discoverer is comparing his own proposal T with the recognized ranges of theories TI from what the tempering condition requires when only the TI recognized by the scientific community are probabilistically compared. That is, in one case, there's some personal involvement in keeping alive and possibly confirming a theory which the, the, the scientist has thought up. In the other case, he's just a judge looking at how well the experimental evidence uh, supports or, or plays down the various theories in the range considered by scientists of his time. I should like to know Agassi's reaction to my admission of psychological considerations into the austere domain of prior, the austere domain of probability logic. Uh, I, I don't know his, I don't know his answer to that. More generally, I should like to hear from Agassi not just evaluations of my proposals for integral epistemology, but also some relevant statements of his own formulation of scientific methodology, very much influenced by his teacher Karl Popper with his own variations. I should not be surprised if his formulation suggests some interesting ingredients for integral epistemology besides those which I and other contributors have suggested. There are three articles in the reference section of his paper in this volume which may satisfied this request, but I'm sorry to say I did not have time to read those to say the answer, but I think they may be worth reading. Thank you. Thank you.